Good afternoon. My name is Fraser Rutherford and I head up the marketing at Environment Bank. Thank you for joining this Farmers Weekly live webinar, Biodiversity Net Gain, How to Secure an Income Without the Risk. As set out in the Environment Act 2021, under law, developers will be required to assess the environmental impact of a development project and will be required to make sure at the end of that project there is more nature than at the beginning. Often this is not possible at the project site, so it needs to be done elsewhere. At a time of uncertainty around farm subsidies and with much economic volatility, this has proved to be a unique opportunity for landowners and farmers to generate additional secured and long-term income through habitat bank creation. These habitats are where nature can thrive to create a quantifiable uplift in biodiversity and will enable developers to meet their biodiversity net gain, or BNG for short, obligations. In this webinar, Ecology Director Emma Toovey will discuss what a habitat bank is, how it is created and managed, and the type of land required. Farm and landowner Toby Diggins will paint a picture of the habitat bank he is creating on his land and the reasons for doing so from both a financial and environmental perspective. Alexis Perry, Commercial Director, will talk about how much can be earned, how to mitigate the risk and how BNG compares to and can work alongside other agri-schemes. And General Counsel Alexa Culver will be joining us via telephone to provide legal guidance throughout. We've had numerous questions already submitted, so thank you so much everyone who submitted those. But please do feel free to ask any questions during the webinar using the question submission box. And we'll leave plenty of time at the end of the webinar to tackle these in detail. So to get started, Emma, what is a Habitat Bank? Thanks so much, Fraser. And it's fantastic to be here today, everyone. So what is a Habitat Bank? Um, in its simplest form, it's essentially a habitat creation project, a project where we want to either create new nature or enhance existing nature to something in its better form. Now, we've been working in this space for more than a decade now, so we're really experienced. So David Hill, Professor David Hill, our chairman, he's a very high profile figure in the nature conservation sector. And James Cross is, our, um, is also, he's our CEO and our, the ex-chief exec of Natural England. So we've totally got this, this is our space. Um, so Habitat Bank, basically, as I said, it's a habitat creation project, but the fundamental thing for us is the first thing is that it's done at scale. So we like large habitat creation projects, something that's meaningful, that's bigger, that's better, that's more, that's going to be joining up and really delivering for nature recovery. So when we talk about size of sites, there isn't a defined minimum, but for us as a business, usually we're looking at as a minimum of 10 hectares um, and it could be anything sort of up to 100 hectares plus. And that can vary really regionally all across England. We'll be looking for slightly different sizes of sites, just really depending on the kind of development pressure in those areas and the availability of land. So that's sort of what number one thing about habitat banks is that they tend to be big. Um, the second thing is that we're really looking for land types where we can deliver an uplift in biodiversity. So first of all, we're kind of looking for land that doesn't already have really great nature on it. So we want something that's pretty poor in biodiversity at the moment. Um, but also we're ideally looking for land that's low productivity as well. So those those agricultural grades that aren't really delivering in terms of the productivity. So that kind of marginal land that we're not really sure what to do with, it's not really delivering incomes for you as landowners, and it's also not already got nature on it. That's the perfect land for us. Um, so uh, could you show my first visuals? That'd be brilliant. So I just thought I'd just show you, this is um, a visualization of one of our habitat banks that we have live. And this is the kind of end result, if you like. It's, it's nothing kind of out of the ordinary, really, type of rural landscape that you might expect where there's been some enhancements for nature already. So the kinds of um, habitat, and you want to flick onto the next image, that'd be great. The kinds of habitat types that we're looking for have really need to kind of sit within the current landscape. So we're looking to deliver species rich meadows, really great species rich uh, hedgerows with trees, um, 
new new woodland planting, new mixed dense and scattered scrub with open glades, that kind of thing. It's the kind of thing that you might see naturally in your in the existing landscape in rural areas. So what we want to do is make sure that it's appropriate to the setting of the site. And we work really closely with all of our landowners to make sure that it works not just ecologically, but also from a practical sense that the landowners that where we're putting these new habitats are completely comfortable with the kinds of habitats that we want to create there. Um, so Lex, are you online? Can you hear me? Um, I thought it might be nice to just yes, touch quickly on on sort of at a high level the kinds of agreements those lease agreements and the habitat management agreements that that we're kind of looking to adopt to EB yeah absolutely so we would ordinarily take a long-ish leasehold interest around about 30 33 years which is long enough to deliver the management obligations that we would be required to deliver to demonstrate the, the real uh, scope for the Habitat bank, bank to evolve and develop. Um, we take a long leasehold interest. We then uh, also enter into a Habitat management agreement with our land managers, which will very often be the owners of the land. But it might be a company uh, that operates the farm, the wider farm area in, in an agricultural setting. And in that Habitat management agreement is where we would deal with the uh, intentions behind developing and enhancing that habitat and that's what will include the actions uh, that would be periodically happening over the years during the life of the habitat bank so that's a very very whistle stop uh, tour of the two core documents that manage the life of the habitat bank Fantastic. And I know we're going to cover lots of questions on this at the end. So don't worry if you've got more, you'd like more detail, we're definitely going to be covering it. But I thought um, now we're going to kind of um, ha have a chat with one of our landowners who we've been working with for the last few months on one of our current live um, habitat banks. So Toby, Toby's here with us today from Mid Devon. Right. Toby, hi, Toby. Um, do you want to just tell us about really why you've you you know you've become involved in habitat banking and what and what really has made it worthwhile for you? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks, Emma, and good evening, everybody. Um, I got involved with the idea of habitat banking and and the and the environment bank through actually being a landscape architect. So the my really quick backstory is that my landscape architecture studio is. On a, on a farm which we also run so the two are very combined and I think it was actually Cornwall Council who adopted biodiversity next in very early I was actually working alongside the ecologists using biodiversity net as a tool to assess up on development and started to understand more and more about it and we realized that through an immunity that we had we could actually purchase a piece of land close to the farm, which me and my wife Bella did. And then we wanted to do something for nature, given that there was a, a very um, heavily farmed landscape all around us. And there are some particularly special habitats that have been lost over the last couple of sec uh, couple of decades, particularly in our case, Colm Grassland, which is um, the home of the marsh fertility, which is now a critically threatened species. We thought that we would just have a go at it. And so far, it's been a, a really good experience. We started restoring the habitat about 18 months ago, sort of slightly preempting the fact that we would sign an agreement with the Environment Bank. And now evidently we've done so. And this this year, I suppose, is our first kind of creation year. So we're, we're sourcing locally, um, locally grown species rich hay from other calm grassland sites to, to actually incorporate onto the land as well as allowing natural regeneration of some woodland. And um, we're also playing with the idea of kind of myco restoration. So mycelial regeneration, because the landscape has, has been so hard hammered and compacted by relentless plowing on very, very hard clay soils, that we actually need to allow for sort of air to, to, to re-enter the soil, to create a soil that would support woodland. So we, we're gonna try and use fungi to do that. So. As well as anything else, the excitement is is the kind of opportunity to to push for this sort of rapid restoration of landscapes, which is something I think we all need, and to see how that goes through through evidently a, a longer term agreement than would be normal for stewardship. 
which allows us to have the security that we're going to still be funded to, to actually keep carrying out these management regimes or prescriptions over the next 30 years, which, which suits us. Fantastic. And is there any particular species or anything that you're really excited to see in the coming years as your, as your site progresses? Yeah, so we have, a, there's, there is a, a pair in the village of Puddington just up from the site who, who used to own the land before it then went through a couple more owners before, before us. And just after the war, they remember seeing curlew and lapwing and golden plover actually nesting on that field. And I'm not sure that anybody's heard of curlew for a while in mid-Devon. Strangely enough, when we were up surveying this year, we saw one and heard one. I thought, oh, well, maybe this is a harbinger of the future because the particular site is absolutely perfect for them. So if we manage in 30 years to get breeding curly back on, on Paddington, I'll be a pretty happy person. Brilliant. Me too. Me too, definitely. Yeah. Fantastic. That's brilliant to hear. So I think now we're going to pass over to Alexis, who's going to talk about the, what I know lots of people are on the call to hear about the commercial stuff. So I'll pass on now. Emma, thank you. Um, and good evening, everybody. Um, well, I'll, I'll just talk through them very quickly. It's a bit about our sort of establishment process, how our model works against others, the payment rates, um, and then sort of the leaves and flex we have in, in how we can create the hopefully the, the best um, offer to the landowners we work with. So firstly, uh, on establishment, it starts with um, registering your site with us through our website. Um, our, our team are on standby. Hopefully it'd be great to hear from, from you. We, you know, we're, we're really keen to, to look at land across England at this point. Um, BNG is mandated across, across England. So we're looking to create a Habitat Bank in every local authority area, and we're fully funded to do that. When you've registered with us, um, what we do is we have a team of ecologists who will do a sort of initial triage process. We'll look at um, initial title issues, the legal sort of uh, practicalities surrounding the land. We'll look at existing stewardship schemes that may be there, the strategic location of the site for nature. It's really important we put uh, nature restoration in the right places. Um, subject sort of completing that triage and feeling, yeah, this is all looking really positive. One of our ecologists uh, will arrange a site walkover with you and they'll come and visit you and walk the, the site with you to take a sort of baseline of the site. And that's really where the, the beginning of a, a sort of co-creation process begins. And we'll start talking about what types of habitats are going to be delivered. Like we say, our, what we create has to fit with your broader estate management plans. Um, so that process will happen probably four to five weeks after that initial registration. Um, following that walkover, um, we will then take away the information we've got and we'll look to create an offer based on the discussions we've had with you um, that really kind of reflects what it is we're creating in terms of the habitat and, and meets your circumstances as best as possible. So that's a, a very high level view on, on getting established. Register on the website and hopefully within um, eight weeks to nine weeks, we can have an offer and then be looking to enter a lease agreement with you soon after that offer has been uh, drafted to you. Then I think the next thing is just to understand the difference of our model between what I would sort of think of as a, a brokerage service, which there are a lot of emerging and what we do. We create habitat at scale, like Emma said, we want to do it all in one go as soon as we can upfront. So when we come to look at your land, it is not with a view of what might happen maybe at a point in time, maybe if a developer needs units. We are entering a lease agreement and trying to get on with that habitat creation across the whole piece as soon as we can. What we're trying to do is create a habitat bank where we can then sell units to a number of different developers. The difference to that scheme is the sort of brokerage model where sometimes you'll be asked to register your land, but you don't quite know when you might be asked to deliver it for habitat restoration, how much of it, what type of habitat, what the payment will be, and very crucially, where the liability sits. And I think there's a huge story in this. As Emma said, we've spent um, over 10 years as a business doing bespoke agreements. And what the Environment Act has done by mandating biodiversity net gain on developers 
is create a framework through which a biodiversity market can establish and we can create nature restoration at scale. And that's all about creating better outcomes, which is excellent for nature. What it means we can also do is because we created at scale, we take the liability from a developer buying a unit and we take it from the landowner creating the habitat. We hold that as Environment Bank. And what you find in a lot of the other agreements is that there's a trade-off with the developer trying to farm the, the liability of failed habitat to the landowner and the landowner wanting it to go back to the developer. And it creates a really complex situation. We're different. We are aligned because we're, we're going through that 30 year process with the landowner. We hold that liability. So it has to work for our landowners in terms of the deals we offer and how we structure our agreements so that we create the best habitat. The big question I know a lot of you will be asking is around then what the actual payment rates are. So as Emma and Lex mentioned, we pay um, some money through a lease, through rent, and we pay some money through a habitat management agreement and carrying out the actions of a management plan. The rent is typically somewhere between 200 to 240 pounds a hectare, depending where you are regionally, and that reflects um, there's the DEFRA farmland indexes for rent and Knight Frank, and, and we keep that updated as well. We try and be at the higher end of that scale, obviously. What we do is also pay a year's worth of rent upfront on entering a lease as well. In terms of the payments through the management plan, first of all, habitat creation, all capital works are paid for by us um, and throughout the term of the agreement. So those, those capital works are paid for by us. They can be carried out by the landowner or a subcontractor. Often that's a, a bit a subcontractor might do because it's a, a really important stage of the process is getting that initial creation right. However, the landowner, if they feel comfortable and can you know, provide, demonstrate that they can quite effectively, they can look to do that as well. We then pay a management fee through the management plan, typically for grassland type environments, that's about £660 a hectare, the same for scrub. Woodland's a bit lower at, at about um, at, at about 150 to 200 pounds, depending on what woodland we're creating. What we're trying to create, as Emma said, is a mosaic of habitats on our sites. Though. So there will be a sort of a blending of, of the rate, as it were. Typically, we're finding we're paying landowners um, between 800 to 900 pounds a hectare, though, depending on, on um, the habitats we're creating. So over the term of an agreement for 30 years, sort of a base payment might be up to £24,000 a hectare, um, up to 27, and then you include indexation on that or in a fixed inflationary allowance, which can take it up to £35,000 a hectare over the 30-year period. We inflate the rent and management annually at a, at a fixed rate at about 2.5%, which is a difficult number in light of the headlines at the moment but the reason we fix that is because we forward fund our whole model so that there's certainty payment will be made we put the funds for habitat creation management fees rent all of the inflationary allowances go into a secure ring fenced account on day one and no other money can come out unless the payments that are due are still there for the rest of the 30-year term or whatever's left of it the reason we therefore have to fix the increases is because we forward fund that. The reason we use that number is we've looked back over 30 years and it's averaged at about 2.1. And that included a period of very high inflation in the early 90s as well. So hopefully over the 30 year term, it all balances out. I think the other point to raise here is we pay for the capital works. So there's no input cost as it were required from the landowner. It's you know, low intensity management. So it's it's time and, and time on a tractor. In terms of um, the levers that we have then, because we're forward funded and fully funded, is there are certain things we can look to do. It's very clear as we've been doing this that um, and gain more and more experience. No two estates are the same. Um, different landowners have different priorities from a tax perspective perspective valuation. So things we can do, for example, are look to make a commuted sum rent payment. So we can make a lump sum payment for rent for the 30 years discounted upfront. 
That sometimes gives us effects to look at how we can adjust inflation rates on the maintenance payments. We can look at how we apportion the rent and maintenance costs and so on. What we try and do is have agreements that can meet the circumstances of the landowners we work with. As I say, it's it's got to work for you as much as it works for us because we're doing it together for 30 years. We aren't stepping back from when the habitat is created and saying get on with it. We we are responsible for that liability. The key point as well, just on payments, is it's very much about delivering the actions of a management plan, not delivering the outcomes. That's all we can expect. There are too many externalities that can affect that. Um, and also just a couple of other points is that we would look to cover um, you know, initial legal fees. And we also pay a, a welcome bonus um, when we enter those lease and management agreements um, with you, which is, is typically about five to 10,000 pounds. So that, in a in a summary, is is how our model works. In terms of comparison schemes, just touching on that very high level, looking at countryside stewardship and so on, we're typically seeing payments with the landowners we're working with who have compared based on a sort of the main creation payment for for say a, a flower rich meadow being at between three and four hundred pounds a hectare over a five or ten year agreement with supplementary incomes that can take that up to 500 sometimes even 600 pounds a hectare so we stand well above that with rent and management coming in at more like eight to nine hundred pounds scrubland is is much lower at sort of two to three hundred and sometimes some additional supplements and woodland we tend to find that the maintenance caps at about 300. so that's a a very quick tour of, of payment rates, a bit about how we, we contract and so on and getting established. Um, and I think now it's uh, time to hand over to do some questions and answers. Yeah, thanks, Alexis. That was brilliant. Yeah, we've yeah we've had loads of questions come through. So I'm going to try and group some of them together. But I think the one common thread is around tax. So I think, Alexis, I might aim this at you. This is from... from um, from Glenn, uh, but like I said, there's some other people which have submitted something similar. So the question goes, is it quite clear with expert legal advisors confirming that land moving from farming to long-term conservation will be open to challenges from HMRC for loss of tax relief? There is also a question around part disposal for capital gains tax, subject to length of agreement, and how does it be ensured against any loss of property relief or other tax reliefs? Yes, that is an excellent question and one that we have been spending a lot of time thinking about and taking some really uh, good expert advice, both in the legal world and in the world of valuers. Um, in fact, only tomorrow we're going to be speaking with Jeremy Moody of the Central Association of Agricultural Valuers, who has um, been a real pioneer in some of the literature that's available on this very topic. There's a note that was circulated in January uh, where he, ex he expresses that he believes that um, a biodiversity net gain habitat bank comprising primarily of species rich meadows, which is what the majority of our habitat banks will be, he believes that a habitat bank like that is very likely to benefit, continue to benefit from agricultural property relief and business property relief. We've been also doing some careful thinking about um, the extent to which um, our leasehold structure is neatly accommodated under the existing Agricultural Tenancies Act 1995. We believe that the majority of our habitat banks do fall within the definition of agriculture. Um, activities like um, uh, using the land for meadows, which is certainly what we're doing on most of our habitat banks, uh, grazing, conservation grazing, um, ancillary woodland, seed growing, all of those activities are things that we are doing in the majority of our habitat banks. Um, so we are working carefully with our landowners to structure this in a way that keeps the door wide open for continued claiming of agricultural property relief. And we do know how important that is. Um, it is untested still, as Jeremy Moody will be very quick to say, and he calls out loud and clear to HMRC and government to give some real clarity on this. But for now, as we're feeling our way through, we believe the majority of our habitat banks do fall into that definition. 
and a farm business tenancy structure, which is from the 1995 Act designed entirely to protect landowners' interests in these situations, is a structure that is very useful to us as we build more and more habitat banks across the country. So we're very open-minded. We are deliberately making sure that our structure respects and preserves the agricultural character of the land that we're working on. Um, and it's a really important thing to get right. Um, in terms of capital gains tax, again, we structure the, um, the finances under the lease to mean that there is no capital disposal. We pay the rents that are set to be neutral from a valuation point of view so that there is no gain or loss of, of, um, of the actual capital value of the land. It's a neutral transaction for that purpose. So again, we're making sure we structure this in a way that is sensible and efficient um, and importantly preserves the agricultural character of the land. I hope that's a helpful answer for now at least. Thank you very much. No, that was really good, really in depth. Um, okay, a different one here. Uh, what are the guidelines for the distance of biodiversity net gain creation is from the development which which causes the biodiversity loss. So this is from David. Um, Emma, did you want to pick that one up? Yeah, I can take that one. So basically, um, the all the biodiversity net gain assessments use something called the biodiversity metric that's been designed by DEFRA, and within that there are kind of three spatial um, categories, if you like. And so it's not measured by distance; it's measured whether or not the biodiversity net gain delivery site is from within the local plan, same local planning authority area as the development itself. If it is within that area, then essentially the developer is rewarded for that because they're delivering their net gain as locally as possible to the impact. Now, the DEF metric does allow the developer to deliver net gains outside of the local planning authority area in either an adjacent area an adjacent local planning authority or even beyond that. But the metric then applies some multipliers, which basically mean that the developer needs to they're sort of penalised for the further away that they get from their development site. So it means that, the, that they have to essentially um, d deliver more um, in, in the simplest form. If that makes really sense, does that Emma. kind of cover that, I think? Yeah, I think so. I think so. We've um, got a financial one, so I'll point this one at you, Alexis. So this is from Mick. Um, the initial B&G contracts with farmers looks very good indeed, giving far more money per hectare than combined BPS and environmental schemes income. Uh, we haven't written this, by the way, <laughs> but that does sound good. It seems likely, though, that the supply of farmland for habitat banking could well exceed the demand for biodiversity units. Is this in this very competitive scenario? What would this mean for the payment rates? Okay, um, good question. Um, so, the payment rates we pay are fixed. You know, we we set them down for thirty years. We forward fund them. They're secure for exactly that reason. You can't have a, a payment rate that suddenly goes down just because there's an increase in, in potential units. Um, I think the volume of supply uh, of land that comes forward for BNG is it's really interesting uh, question. Um, there'll be bespoke schemes, they'll always be aligned directly with supply. There's us doing this larger scale at the moment. There are, there are a few others that we know of doing it that way. Um, I think also though, there will be increased demand for biodiversity units as well. Um, there are already signals that 10% net gain is not enough. Um, people like to see that go to 20%, which will in increase viability. Secondly, um, offsetting and nature investment from, from companies is becoming a significant thing to look at as well now. We're, we're very much uh, trying to adapt our model to, to see how we can deliver biodiversity gain for, uh, for corporate businesses. So I think that hopefully... The payment rates we offer will certainly be fixed um, unless landowners are incentivized properly to deliver this and that it's competitive with what you might otherwise earn it the whole system's going to fall apart so um, hopefully those rates will, will be fairly firm 
Brilliant. Alexis, whilst you're here, so I've got two other questions which are linked. So I've got one from Rob. It says, does the scheme only cover England or do we look at farms in Wales as well? And I've got another one from Ian, which is, are there particular rules that apply to Scotland? Um, so at the moment, yes, the Environment Act is an English statute. So we are looking in England at the moment is our core focus, but we expect Scotland and Wales to follow soon with their own devolved policies, as it were. Um, so Scotland, we're not looking at at the moment, but we've got a lot of uh, interested parties there it's somewhere we really want to start looking at nature restoration as well. So we will get there in time. It's just a question of, of when that policy lands. Excellent. Fantastic. And you might want to hang on for this one as well. Um, so uh, another question here. Are there any safeguards if companies become bankrupt? Um, well, for us, as I mentioned, I think that's, you know, if you're looking at other schemes, that's a really good question to ask is how is that finance secured? We ring fence our, our funds. There's very strict provisions on on the loan notes that, that fund our agreements, like I say, that ensure that those sums for rent, for management payments, the inflationary allowances are there, they're secure for the 30 year term. And to meet best practice guidance as well, that's what should be happening. And um, you have to forward fund. You've got to give certainty that that habitat can be created. So, um, so we do that. Um, it's, you know, if landowners are looking at schemes, I, I think that's a real qualification question actually of, of the integrity of the scheme. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, so this one might be for Emma, actually. Um, this is quite specific. We currently own 15 acres of woodland and 30 acres of land left to rewild over the last 20 years or so. We currently, currently receive no income from this. Is there a way of making money out of this existing with the Environment Bank? Great question. You've been active already in this space. So um, basically what, what we would need to do um, is essentially re-baseline and understand where where you are with your site. So we do take on sites where there are existing habitats, but where they've been managed to perfection and you're already delivering this incredibly excellent biodiversity, that would be really difficult for us to basically generate that uplift that we need to demonstrate to um, to then es essentially create these units that we can then sell on. So, but we wouldn't rule it out at this stage. What we could do is, um, you know, d essentially do an assessment and work out what the condition of those habitats is at the moment and see if there is an opportunity to further increase their biodiversity value. But one thing to think about is that, you know, the government is already saying that they're looking to incentivize landowners to continue to manage, retain land for nature and continue to manage it well. And that over the coming years and decades, that, that landowners will be absolutely incentivized to do that through the, the kind of benefits from natural capital assets that they're generating. So whilst EB, we would look at that and it may or may not be viable, we, we are moving into a space where natural capital and the ecosystem service benefits that are generated by landowners will be rewarded, whether it's through public or private finance. So I think totally keep doing what you're doing. Um, it's a really early, early days, but the, I think there's loads of opportunity going forward, whether it's through us or other other means. Brilliant. And, and we've got another one here whilst you're on. So uh, Miss Canthus land is excluded from countryside stewardship options. So will this land be eligible eligible for BNG payments? Great. Another great question. We've got sites at the moment that we're looking at which have miscanthus on them. Um, essentially, miscanthus in its own right doesn't offer a biodiversity value sort of under our metric in terms of the way we have to assess sites. So we can absolutely take on land where there's miscanthus present already currently but we would need to essentially rework that land and create something different upon it so we would you any any agreements that you have in place to deliver miscanthus we would need to kind of end those and then move forward with a different agreement with us that um would involve creating um more more natural habitats in that area brilliant thank you um okay so 
Another one here. Um, in the past, all environmental schemes have been associated with specific calendar dates. Yet we know there are large annual and geographic differences, in some cases by as much as three to four weeks. How can these be taken into account on a national scheme? I'm not sure who wants to take that one. I um, think one for Lex. That, yeah, Lex, yeah, go for I'm that. <laughs> Yes, I mean, think, something I've been thinking a lot about recently is the interplay between our scheme and other statutory schemes. Um, and I do know some of the challenges that people face being um, sort of bound to certain seemingly arbitrary timescales in order to, to, to put claims in for various entitlements. Um, and it can be a real bind in the calendar year. In this instance, talking about biodiversity net gain, this is a private scheme that will ultimately be managed under the Environment Act where there will be a game site register. Aside from this game site register, which is where we will register our habitat banks, um, there is no, uh, we do not believe there to be yet any uh, sort of national policy over timings for any of this to be done. So we can be creating habitat banks throughout the year and going through a registration process. We would be paying you rent. Um, and management fees in accordance with the leases and with the management uh, habitat management agreements. Those would be based on the deal timetable that we secure with you. It wouldn't be based on any national timetable. So in this instance, we don't envisage any nationally uh, sort of prescribed timetable in the way you may have seen in statutory schemes, but instead ours would be a private arrangement where the timetable would work according to the deal that we agree with you. Um, and the idea then is that you're, you're able to make this work in a way that suits you, your business and your cash flow. I hope that helps. It, yeah, but I was just going to add to that. I think that's exactly right. And actually the habitat management plans that we design with the landowners are completely bespoke to mm. your, you know, your land. So all of this you know and and it will absolutely take into those regional variations and the seasonality differences and all of those things that don't work at a national level we're able to really define those at a site by site basis because we work with you as a landowner and they're bespoke to you so that's sort of just to add a bit of flavor to that brilliant um alexis i've got one here maybe for you and i think we've already discussed this but it's worthwhile going through again so amy has asked how do farmers navigate a 30-year management of the bngs um how do farmers navigate 30 years of bng well i think um i think that's as, as sort of strikes me as, as much as an ecology question as anything mm. it's you know, we, we have a, a management plan that very clearly sets out the the actions required to get to a target condition. Like I say, we, we pay based on the actions, um, the and, and not the outcomes of meeting that management plan. There, it's it's a live document. There will be, you know, variation as things will inevitably need changing, perhaps through the year. Um, but we navigate through that with them and, and the plan is created and it's a constant relationship. We come and monitor every year um, through those 30 years. We have a vested interest in making sure that the best habitat is created so that through the 30 years, there's always someone on hand to help um, steer the ship in the right direction, as it were. Um, that's our our responsibility. I, I don't know, Emma, if you want to add to that at all, add, add a bit any more depth. Yeah. No, I, I was going to say exactly the same. You know, it's a relationship, like you say, 30 years. We have the habitat management plan that we co-design co with the landowner, but that's adaptable and we work, you know, it's an uncertain climate. You know, climate change is happening. We know that there may be flood events, there may be drought events, there may be a whole range of things that happen through that 30-year period. And we just adapt, with, with, we work with the landowner and adapt and essentially go to go on that journey together. Yes, and I'm just going to interrupt you a bit there, Emma, and I hope you don't mind. But I, oh, I also want to also want to stress how it's not the land manager or landowner's problem if those events happen. That's that's for us to deal with the 
uh, repercussions in terms of the biodiversity units that might be generated on the site. So nothing would affect the income that the landowner or land manager receives under the lease or habitat management agreement. You take that cash as a fixed income. Um, we deal with the ebb and flow of the actual unit yield and we deal together with how we would change the habitat management plan to good any uh, unforeseen weather events or similar. I just thought I'd flag that quickly yeah. in case that was useful for, for people Brilliant. to understand. Yeah, because also the costs associated with any interventions as a result of any of those events, they, they're they all part of that forward fund that Alexis mentioned. So, you know, in that fund, we cover all of the capital costs, but there's also a really healthy contingency in there to, to deal with those interventions. So that wouldn't in any way come out of those management payments that that again that risk sits with us so yeah brilliant point Lex. Great thank you um, okay so this one a very topical one um, I'll point this at Alexa so Anthony uh, has, has uh, asked has the recent and dramatic increase in food prices changed attitude and approaches to B&G as a long-term strategy? Um, yes yeah, I, I mean we're, we're, we're hearing it a lot um, there is a sudden, you know, consideration, and I think we're, we're seeing it with landowners, particularly with the, the price of, of, of wheat and, and so on at the moment. But you know, input costs are up as well. But but um, fundamentally, we have to um, prioritise uh, habitat restoration. And the scale of land we're talking about is is not significant in the in the broader picture of, of English farming. Um, you know, we have nine million hectares of, of farmland in England, and we're talking about, at the moment, six to 10,000 hectares through BNG is sort of based on an FTEC report coming forward for habitat restoration. Um, we're also, where are we locating the habitat restoration? For us, it's got to be where it's viable for the landowner anyway, where they were maybe considering a stewardship scheme. So it tends to be grade three, grade four, quite, um, quite, you know, depleted, heavily degraded land already and pasture land as well, because we're trying to get that biodiversity additionality as well. So so in the main, a lot of habitat restoration is occurring on unproductive land in the first place. I think the final point, and, and then we could maybe talk more on this from an ecology perspective, but it's just unless we fix biodiversity, there is a biodiversity crisis, the whole of the ecosystem is is threatened anyway so it's actually you know creating habitat creating biodiversity it should be seen as as a benefit and not something that takes away um from food security in the round brilliant um i think and on that topic we've got another one um it might be aimed at emma this one actually from eleanor um, to ask, how can habitat and biodiversity reporting become a competitive advantage with agri-food supply chains Okay, that's an interesting question. So I think, I think if I'm interpreting that right, it's sort of referring more to the the need for for landowners to demonstrate to perhaps their clients, um, the Sainsburys of the world, who are buying our products, that that they're doing positive things for biodiversity and that they need to report against that. Um, so I would say that, yes, there's an opportunity for that on our habitat banks. What One thing that we need to just be really careful of that we're demonstrating all of the time is that um, there's an additionality associated with the habitats that we're creating. So where, where we're offsetting an impact from a developer, which is un fundamentally what biodiversity net gain is for. It's about offsetting an impact from a development scheme somewhere else and then delivering nature here on our habitat banks to, to kind of compensate for that loss somewhere else. So what we would need to make sure is if you're also using that biodiversity to offset um, a sane, you know, the, the operational activities of Sainsbury's, for example, then you're almost double counting. So we need to be really clear about how we how we measure, how we monitor, how we report against all of that biodiversity and where it's essentially being assigned, if you like. Um, 
but it, that is exactly the space that we're moving into. We're moving into, you know, organisations are being required to report against that. So any landowner that is able to demonstrate that, they're able to say, yes, I'm doing something really positive here and I can report against it, then it, it can only be a positive thing, I would think, um, for, for any anyone that you're supplying goods to. Hopefully that kind of covers that one. <laughs> that sounds really, really good. Um, just a quick one. Um, if we've had Alexis, it's just some confirmation on is is payment is the payment by habitat result or management done? It's just a bit of a query. Uh, it is on habitat done. Is it where management undertaken? Um, it is. You know, actions, we, not outcomes. Actions, not outcomes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, an oft-used phrase uh, in the business. No, it's it, absolutely. I think we've covered the point. Hopefully, already. There. Uh, and another one, just just confirming, is, is on the is there a minimum and maximum area for which your scheme applies? Um, yeah, for, for us, we you know we're trying to do things at scale. Um, and it's, it's also driven by perceived demand as well. We've done a, a policy review of in every local planning authority, um, looking at housing need, employment land need, infrastructure need across over 300 local authorities in England. That was a fun exercise. Um, and what we have is, a, is an understanding of the demand in those locations. What we therefore try and do is create a habitat bank that meets that, but 10 is our minimum. Um, and it goes all the way, as I says, right up to 100. And as you can imagine, it's it's areas where there's more development pressure that, that drives the need for, for, for wider scale habitat restoration as well. Brilliant. And on that, Alexis, this is a question from Adam. Um, with all this habitat bank creation, what is the impact likely to be on land values? Cool. Um, so land values are through our rent that we're paying, the management agreement and so on, looked at over a 30 year term, yields by the land values should be maintained, if not improved. Um, I think land values are, are safe, hopefully. I think um, that's that's across the piece. What happens on the reversionary period at the end of the 30 year term? What's, what's the land going to be worth? Well, we'd either look to rebaseline and enter a new scheme. DEFRA have said at the end of 30 years that the sort of the value of the natural capital that's been created will be rewarded. Um, so there's a bit of a question mark there, but I think the world we're moving to will, um, you know, the value of, of natural capital will, will be returned in the land values as well. So I would expect land values certainly not to diminish as a result of the schemes we're looking at. Um, and obviously in, in some regional areas, we are seeing land values increase where there's real pressures, uh, where, where there's less land availability for habitat restoration, but high development pressures. Um, we are seeing, seeing it have a, an effect on land values there. Nitrates and phosphates is another story, um, but this is about biodiversity. As a rule, there it should it should maintain the status quo. Right, brilliant. Thanks, Alexis. Well, we'd like into the last sort of five or ten minutes. We've still got loads of questions to go through, but um, Alex, I'm going to point this one at you. Um, so this is from David. We are a charity with much land in different levels of stewardship. We don't know yet what exactly will happen to the income in a new era. Can BNG schemes be introduced now without prejudicing our, our eventual income when our current agreements expire? Yeah, a really good question, a really important point for all of the landowners we work with. You know, the existing statutory schemes available are all changing. Um, BPS is obviously being tapered out till 2027. Elms are coming in. There's policy announcements all the time about it. And um, really importantly for us, the structure that we adopt does not close the door to future claims. Certainly um, the SFI um, messaging on that from government is they absolutely want those schemes to run concurrently with private schemes. They're really keen to support private schemes and really keen to make sure that landowners are overall better off um, and not disincentivized from entering into private schemes. So we have designed our structure to uh, keep the door open on future schemes because, you know, 33 years is a long time and we don't know what might be out there that you can benefit from as a landowner um, and that together we can make sure we can get claims in jointly, 
We can make sure you've got sufficient management control to demonstrate the right regulatory authority. And the most important thing, of course, from our point of view is that whatever is happening on the ground does not conflict with our primary purpose, which is biodiversity net gain. But we are absolutely open to, and it's an essential part of the structure from our point of view, that there is the flexibility to move with the legislation, move with the policy as it evolves, as it matures, and as it wanes over the coming 33 years. Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, um, this question is from Ross, and I think this one will be for you, Emma. Um, can the ecology of flora and fauna around and under field scale, scale ground mount solar scheme be used for the banking of brownie points? If the species planted are diverse and beneficial, this would be instead of mowing or grazing. In short, yes. Um, so there's actually quite a few examples now where solar farms are being delivered on the same site where a species rich grassland that that's kind of that may, maybe it's been um, reverted from arable to a species rich grassland and there's also a solar farm on top if you like that that still needs to be managed um, it still needs to be managed for biodiversity whether it's through grazing or mowing or some other form um, and you can absolutely generate biodiversity units from those sites and it is happening now and I know that um, that there are examples of that however from an environment bank perspective at the moment we aren't looking to take on those kinds of schemes just from a, but there are some um, conflicts potentially between the sort of contractual side and also the um, the yield of biodiversity, if you like, the up, the uplift isn't quite enough for us to to make it viable as a project from an environment bank perspective. But there there probably are other organisations you can talk to. Brilliant, thank you. Um, right, so we've got one here from Alex uh, about carbon, but I think it will fit in to what we're discussing so will the carbon market be seeking to be regulated by government so as to create confidence with the land owning sector Lexi would you be able to say that one yeah of course because I think the really interesting thing about that question is that it's a question about carbon which actually is not technically what we're looking at at this precise moment with biodiversity net gain. But what I think is really interesting about that question is it shows the interchangeability of these different natural capital schemes and things that happen, say, in the carbon market that, um, that lose the confidence of landowners because uh, they have, you know, some, there's some reputational damage in that market. Um, can then obviously spill over into the BNG world, and we really want to differentiate ourselves from that. One of the helpful things about BNG is that it is already a regulated thing under the planning, uh, under the planning laws and under the Environment Act 2021. So already the whole system of biodiversity net gain is coming into being through a regulated system that has already learned from some of the mistakes of the kind of wild west of the carbon market. So um, in terms of that question, I, well, I suppose I'm just keen to emphasize that this is, uh, we ourselves will be carving a, uh, and are carving a very careful path through the regulatory system. We will be regulated by the planning authorities. Conservation covenants, when they come in under the Environment Act shortly, will also play a careful role in monitoring the way in which the habitat banks are, are um, managed and monitoring the way in which units are sold to absolutely avoid the kinds of challenges that have happened in the carbon market where mm. the regulatory element is now needing to catch up. Whereas here, we begin with regulation. Um, and I hope that's a helpful answer. Brill, thank you. Uh, right, really good question here actually uh, from Fiona. Are tenants able to engage in this process? And is there an established model for landlord consent? Who would like to take that one? I think that's a good one for for Lex. Um, <laughs> from a legal perspective. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, definitely a good one. Would you mind saying it again? Because I slightly switched off. <laughs> oh. oh, I just lost it now. So, I, was um, is... I was gazing at the River Avon behind me through a big window and I lost concentration. <laughs> that's lovely. So it's about... Um, how, how does it work? How does the process work for tenants? Ah, yes. 
So, importantly, again, um, we really absolutely want to um, respect the interest of tenant farmers. Um, tenant farmers that, you know, exactly the 1995 Agricultural Tenancies Act was there to encourage landowners to feel comfortable letting their land out. And the structure that we've adopted can work with tenants too. So we can either slot in as a landlord of those tenants and look after them as a landlord and um, respect their use and occupation of the land alongside the Habitat Bank. And there are other sort of clever techniques we can do to allow sites to remain tenanted. Um, because that's a really important part of, um, you know, from our point of view, widening the scope of the land that's available to us. And from a policy point of view, really going along with the obvious um, government policy direction towards making sure that tenant farmers aren't crowded out of this. Yeah. So it would be an, a, an agreement um, that is reached with the landowner, the tenant farmer and us. And there are lots of clever ways that we can make the structure work for that. Yeah, absolutely. And the, all, all I'd add to that is to say that, you know, a key point of our model, this is about the diversification of, of rural incomes. And, and unless tenants are a part of that, it's, it's not right. It's got to be something that everyone can engage in. Um, and so we are very much keen to, to, to make it work with tenants as well and doing all the clever things that Lex just said. Um, the answer there. Brilliant. Right, we're probably getting down to the last couple of questions. Um, okay, so this one's just coming from Joe. Uh, if I am 55, 85 at the end of the scheme, and if I'm still alive, am I too old to be considered for this scheme? And the second part of that question, what happens is the farmland had to be sold unexpectedly during this time of the agreement? I could answer that. Yes. Shall, I, shall I jump in? Yeah. Go for it, then. You're yeah. never, never, ever, ever too old, ever, ever, ever to work with us at all. Um, now, the way that leasehold structures work is that lease, the leasehold interest that we take will survive any succession. It will survive any sale of the property. And so in a situation where, let's say, a landlord uh, dies or decides to sell the land where our Habitat Bank is, is situated, that would not interfere with the structure. So whoever the land is sold to would automatically step into the shoes of the outgoing landlord and the whole arrangement would continue with them. So you're never too old to work with us and the structure would survive succession and sales. Um, and that's why, again, it's really important that the structure suits the long-term aims and objectives of the family, of the business, um, and of, of, of the people that are here today and who will be there tomorrow. Yeah, uh, and, and all I would add to that is, um, as, as one landowner we're working with said, when this agreement ends, I'll be 102. Um, so it sort of, you know, was a moment for him to take stock and actually through the, you know, some of the legal undertakings we'll make, it's a chance to look at some of those succession planning, estate, estate planning activities at the same time as well. But yeah, absolutely. Definitely never too old to work with Environment Bank. Brilliant, thank you. Right, last question to run out of time, but it's a really good one uh, from Sophie. Is a requirement to work with the local planning authorities? Alexis, do you like that one? Um, yeah, there is a, you know, as part of the lease, we're, we're entering 106 obligations. If if the landowner is required to, to come in line, we would look for that. It You know, it doesn't affect the, the sort of, the terms of what we're doing it's it's just enab enabling the whole basis of the scheme effectively um so so we do have that right in there lex do you want to add anything further on that yeah yep yeah, certainly so we so the way in which a habitat bank is regulated will be through planning obligations with the local planning authority and soon through conservation covenants that are going to be newly introduced under the environment act and which are intended to be um, a, a really useful vehicle for people to manage the conservation of their land without needing to work with a local authority, um, but instead work with what will be called responsible bodies. And there could be a whole proliferation, a range of responsible bodies that come into existence over the coming years, whose job will be to manage and monitor the conservation of land and also habitat banks that we're creating. 
Um, so we do work with the local planning authority. We engage carefully and and um, and really, uh, you know, heavily with local planning authorities because um, they're central to what's going on on the ground and certainly central to the monitoring right now. And equally, they are also who accept our biodiversity units um, as as appropriate evidence of biodiversity net gain. So we work really hard to show them just the scope and scale of what we're doing uh, and the benefits that we're bringing and they then accept our certificates of biodiversity units um, in order to then discharge the planning conditions of the associated development that those units are being linked to uh, which I, I hope again is that that's a helpful answer. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. I think we're out of time now. We've got so many questions which we still got to get to but we will endeavour to get uh, through those uh, by email or, or please just give us a shout give us a call and we can answer those directly um, I would like to thank Farmers Weekly for helping us this webinar and obviously Emma, Alexa and Alexis uh, for doing such a good job on the presentation and the questions and of course Toby thank you so much for joining us as well um, we really hope we provide some real clarity around BNG uh, and our model um, you can find more on our website. Uh, there's also in the portal, I believe, there's one of our brochures which you can download. Uh, we'll also be at Groundswell next week. We've got a stand there. We'll be there for both days. So if anyone wants to drop in, ask some more questions, meet the team, then, then please do. Um, as Alex said, if you if you would like to progress to the next stage or to, to understand specifically uh, about the options for your land, for habitat creation, income, the best place to start is, is register your land on our website so you can go to environmentbank.com forward slash registry or it's in the top navigation there's a small form you have to provide a few details about your land but that allows us to kind of do a first initial review and then we can call you up with some actual concrete information about what we what we can how we can work with you so thank you so much again we've been overwhelmed by the level of interest uh, a number of questions so just thank you so much for joining us and have a lovely evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.